Thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around. I realize it's getting late in the day, but um, I'm hopefully going to give you some interesting conversation with this, these two gentlemen. I'm Alex Webb. I'm a, an a columnist on the Bloomberg <coughs> Opinion team. Now, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, Spurs opened their new stadium in April. It's about 62,000 person capacity on the site of the old White Hart Lane, which was the club's home for the best part of well, more than a century. Price mooted at around £850 million. Pounds. I'm sure the club hasn't confirmed that, but it's a big chunk of change. Be interested to know from your side, when, what was the first, when was the first time you met and how did the conversation evolve? Perhaps what sort of issues did you identify and then what opportunities did you see to, to fix them? Yeah, well, yeah well, I think we, we, we started the conversation back in 2016. And I think there's, there's been a history of a, a strong relationship between Hewlett-Packard and Spurs going right back to, I mean, I remember Ginola in the 80s or 90s wearing a, a Hewlett-Packard shirt. So the relationship was there and the conversation started at a senior level. We were both personally involved. And I think some of that was driven by the research you had done on Stadia in the US. I don't know if you want to... Yeah, I mean, we, we, um, all the technologies that we chose at our new stadium were based on capabilities. So whether, whether the work that we did on our uh, network or digital signage uh, and, and other solutions, we, we chose everything on uh, capabilities and where can companies take us uh, moving forward. What we didn't want to do is choose products and solutions that were already available in the market. So, for example, in the work that we did with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, you know, we went to many companies in, in the same space, um, and, and obviously Hewlett Packard Enterprise do much more than some of those uh, network businesses. Um, and we went through an entire uh, uh, RFP process, really, to choose the best solution that met our vision of, of creating uh, the most technologically advanced stadium in the world. I think, I think one of the things that stood out for me from the meeting, and I, remember, I do remember the meeting, was the comment that this stadium would be designed and built with technology at its heart, and that had never been done before. Uh, clearly, technology provides a lot of opportunities. Like, you know, as a, a you know, football club is a business, and you know, you've got to make sure that all that money you're throwing into the stadium delivers a return for you. There have clearly been a lot of processes put in place to improve, on the one hand, the, the fan experience, but hopefully that encourages fans to spend a little bit more money. What, are, for you, are the highlights? There are new bars which offer some processes which you've enabled. Perhaps if you could suggest some of the, uh, the highlights for you of that technology. I think the, the, the biggest highlight for me is that we're the only, I would say that we're 100% cashless. I think we're the only stadium in the world that is 100% cashless for food and beverage, uh, premium, and also retail. So if you go into any of our uh, general admission concourses, you, you can't pay with cash, of course. Even program sales, <laughs> we, we take no cash at all in our venue. And what's the advantage for that? The, the advantage, yeah, the advantage mainly is the speed of service. So if you look at some of the transaction volumes we have, you know, um, our last game of the season, we had over 60,000 transactions in, in a day, um, including retail, food and beverage. You know, we've peaked at about five transactions a second during the half-time period. Um, the hour before the game starts, if it's a three o'clock kickoff, the hour before, we're processing 20,000 transactions. It's a huge volume. And the advantage you have by being cashless is obviously speed of service, of course. Um, your operational staff can serve quicker. Um, there's the hygiene factor. We're not exactly you know, exchanging notes. We don't have this process of end of day cash up of, of money. So there's some huge advantages that we have there by being a cashless stadium. And do you have any sense of, so 60,000 um, uh, transactions are uh, well, match day. The match day. How, how clearly this is a bigger stadium, 60,000 people, but how might that have compared to the old White Hart Lane? White Hart Lane was a, you know, a capacity of 36,000, and, and actually the year before we closed, we were at 31,000. We took out a corner of the stadium. We had a traditional till system where we took cash. You know, somebody plugged some numbers in and took cash. So it, the, you can't really compare. Our comparison may, may, maybe is with regards to US venues who are not really cashless, but they process probably the same volumes. But US venues for NFL is a very long event. You know, an NFL game is four or five hours. So if you compare our stadium with, say, the likes of uh, Wembley Stadium or, or the Emirates or, or Old Trafford, uh, I believe that we're turning over more transactions, and that means obviously more spend per head. Uh, but what really is important is, is the offering that you give to your fans. You know, we are giving several different varieties of beer. Uh, we have our own brewery on site. Um, we, we have a huge production kitchen that bakes every single pie and uh, sausage roll, for example. We have food concessions that way where you can grill and fry on site 
um, right in front of the fan. I we have, we have a pizza HP, place. HP didn't make... They didn't do that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but where, where we H have tested the brewery. I came yeah, of course, yeah. Oh, yeah. Where HP's technology has really helped us is obviously it's, it's the local area network to drive those things, but more importantly, the wireless services. So if you look at the Wi-Fi, as a really good example. Not only are we offering Wi-Fi to our fans, but it also acts as a corporate service to us. So, for example, in retail or premium um, services, we, do, we use... Um, uh, mobile devices, we do queue busting, and all that's enabled through Aruba, a subsidiary of HPE, Aruba Technologies. Actually, one thing that would be interesting to know, and maybe we haven't talked about this previously, but some of the applications which you've applied at, at Tottenham, what sort of fields did you not pinch them from, but where have they been applicable elsewhere? Yeah, I, well, I think, you know, Stadium in the US have been advanced to Stadium in the UK, and we've obviously got a strong presence out there. I think as you, as you look at what we're doing at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, you, you've got connectivity at scale. You've got 100% wireless coverage, which is great, and you've got secure connectivity. But the final piece of that, then, is analytics. So it generates a huge amount of data. So how can you take that data, understand it in real time, and use that to change the match day experience as it happens? And one of the, the real learnings from that was what we did at the Ryder Cup mm -hmm. in 2018. So we provided all the secure connectivity at the Ryder Cup, and then for the first time really used the data to tell the Ryder Cup in Europe how many people came, but were they the same people on each day? How do they move around the course? Where were the pinch points? Where did they dwell? Where did they spend in terms of football versus retail outlet? And then how you use that data to plan for the next event. Now that was something you do for, for a one point in time to do again in four years. We're trying to do that every single match day in real time. So can you give a concrete example of that? So if you discover there's a pinch point in the Ryder Cup or... Yeah, well, the concrete that. example that, that, that Tom Hopson would be is if you've got a scenario where certain food points are very, very full, for anyone that's on the, the, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium app, you will then get advised to, you know, if you want your pie, don't go, to, don't go this way, follow this um, wayfinding that will take you to somewhere with a smaller queue so that you can get served more quickly. That's... that's happening right now with, with data. Yeah, and I think just to add one other thing to that is, you know, we, we put in a lot of infrastructure in at the stadium. So, for example, in one of our early games, I think it was the first or second game, we realised the demand in our South Stand marketplace. So this is a, an area where which we have a 17,500 capacity single-tier stand. We had approximately at that time 40 uh, fixed EPOS tills uh, there. You know, we literally, within the next day, we realised the demand, we saw that we needed, we had a pinch point, we just installed an additional 20 tills overnight, ready for the next game, which is two days later. So, all of a sudden, we have a, have a long bar now with over 60 to 70 tills, so fans can get served quickly, and obviously the bottoms up beer helps us as well. The, Everyone loves that, don't they? <laughs> the bottoms up beer. There's only people that sort of touch the bottom, don't the, touch the hole, the and the beer I think you can out. YouTube it, it's, uh, it's <laughs> all on there. Um, it's interesting, I did look at some of the numbers, and you know, last year in match day revenue, companies' house filings showed Spurs did 71 million quid. Huge uplift from the previous year, where it was 45 million, but still well short of Man United, which is 110. And I tend to think Man United in the UK, at least, is the benchmark. I don't know whether that's fair or not. Of course, you worked at Man City previously, so maybe we won't appreciate that comparison. Um, do you have a sense of how much you, you know, the new stadium as a, you know, will be able to deliver more yeah, in I mean, match day you, revenues? Your match day revenues... And of course, it depends on Champions League, I Yeah, of course. Well. I mean, look, obviously, match day revenue, the number that you've, you've given, we played at Wembley for that year. Right. So this is the reason we went up from the 45, obviously, to the, to the 71. You know, I, I would expect the match day revenues to be more in this venue, um, and mainly because we are open a bit longer for our general admission fans. We hope to play more games. Uh, so a longer run in the Champions League or many cups means more, uh, of course, means more uh, fans turning up. We also are also have the, we're also going to have two NFL games at our venue in October, uh, so, and the NFL is a very long event. And obviously, we have plans to do concerts and other events. So we, we announced uh, Saracens Rugby, for example, as well. So we have a lot of events compared to, say, Manchester United or some of the other people. So I would expect the numbers to go up and a lot you, more. You need a lot of events because you have a big you bill need to a lot pay. Of it, yes. Um, I, I wondered for, for you guys, I mean, what's interesting I find as well is the way that commercial partnerships seem to have developed in sport. Um, if you look at, for example, Bayern Munich, they have as shareholders, you know, Allianz and Adidas and um, Audi, the unit of Volkswagen, and those guys actually help them run their business. And, you know, when you talk about the historical relationship that HP, as was, had with yep. Spurs, you pay some money and you get your brands on a shirt. That's clearly evolved. The financial transactions, I imagine, a little bit different, but you are getting some halo effect out of it. How have you seen the, the kind of commercial relations with football or with sports teams evolve in, in your time at the company? 
Sure. Well, I, th I think there's a difference between consumer brands and business brands. And you know, clearly, if you look back at enterprise as a business-to-business -business brand, now there is a, a technology partnership because one of the things we, we look at is how can you explain what technology does? How can you bring to life something like technology? The Tottenham Hotspur Stadium is a great example of that. So the, the demand we have from existing customers, potential customers, staff, media, all sorts of people who want to see the stadium, but to see the technology in action at the stadium is incredibly compelling. So we do look at that as a, as a really strong asset we can use to tell the story about who we are and the outcomes you deliver with technology. Does that mean you've got a better deal? Um, well, I mean, the, the commercial deal and the procurement deal ran separately. Absolutely. Okay. So we, we chose HP on capabilities. So we already made a decision to work with Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And you're paying full sticker price for everything? We, we pay. I mean, they price. negotiated hard, right? We negotiated Very hard. So we, we pay for, obviously, for, for what we buy. Um, obviously, it's part of my job to negotiate pricing, and, and that was, a, I think, a tough conversation with Mark on that, because obviously Mark needs to run his business. It was tougher with Daniel it when was. he got involved. Yeah. So, so, so obviously Mark needs to run his business, and obviously the, from a commercial partnership perspective, our commercial team, you know, they, they engage with Mark, um, and, and obviously his, his team in the U.S. on, on what can we do for, to create a story about this stadium. And I think for any of you who've been to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, I think you'll see that we've changed the fan experience and we also change in the customer experience for various events like this you know we can hold events like this at our stadium so i think we're changing Maybe a the few empty seats <laughs> well i mean we have we, we ran i mean they've got a great conferencing facility there i think it's one of the biggest conferencing yeah. spaces now in london and we had an event last week where we had 600 uk employees at the event and we beamed it live to 60,000 employees globally and uh, yeah it's great to do that at a, at a football stadium and just one, one point on the the, the partnership. You know, we ran two very, very separate processes. There was clearly a, a technology decision and a commercial negotiation that ran on one standpoint, and we had a discussion around what is the value of that asset. And I think the kind of the message from the football club was if, you know, if you're going to put all of your technology in, there is a huge marketing opportunity here. Would you want to buy value from that asset just given how strong the story is? And we ran and explored that. So, so wait, can you break that down? So, because uh, there was a lot of speaking that I'm not sure I quite understood. So, you're saying that you have, on, on the one hand, you've got then the commercial agreement where you guys are paying I buy here. Yes. And the other hand, you're saying, well, we'll chip some money back in and therefore we get some halo well, effect from the asset. Well, so, we've got a technology asset. So, the question is, is when you look to market what your organization does, using the asset of the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium is incredible. So, but, you know, Sanjeev would not necessarily want to host us taking around our customers every single week for fun, right? There's a cost to Tottenham Hotspur for doing that, so we would effectively invest in using that asset, which is, is quite right and quite proper. Got it. It was quite interesting. I'd like to open this up a little bit more to the role of a CTO at a, at a sports team. Uh, literally this morning in our editorial meeting in, in, in the opinion team, I was in the office, unfortunately, and I said I'm off to do this panel this afternoon um, with the CTO of, of Spurs. And to his perennial shame, I won't name him, he said, why does Spurs need a CTO? It, it, to me, it, it is a valid question. It, was it a position that even existed 10 years ago? Or, you know, you're at Manchester City before. I'd love to know how that evolved yeah, the idea I mean, of needing one. So I tell, you, I tell you what it is. I mean, the top football clubs around Europe, around the world, uh, sports organizations, they always have a leader of IT. Right? You, you have, I have a head of IT. He works for me. He, he, he looks after our infrastructure and operations. That's a very traditional IT role. The way we saw it at our club was technology being an enabler for uh, sponsor agreements or fan experience and working closely with our digital field as well. But not only do we look after in this role uh, IT functions or the delivery of our new stadium, but we also get involved on the football side, which is the, probably the most exciting side to get involved in. There's so much technology in football that if we didn't have a technology leader, we'd be making some mistakes on uh, products that we choose. We'd be duplicating solutions and products. So what we have at Tottenham Hotspur, and, and we have this at some of the other clubs as well, whatever the job title is for, for these individuals, um, you do need a technology leader to help drive change within the organization, to work with companies um, such as Hewlett Packard Enterprise and other businesses out there to make the right decisions to support our organizations. If you look at what's also happening with broadcast, we have a significant broadcast infrastructure at our stadium in terms of broadcast production and everything we do there. But also the football side, as I said, is, is really key. If the technologies that we put in can support our football performance and we can squeeze another three points, that's actually worth, worth doing the job. Do, uh, how has the state, I mean, there's clearly a big weight on the technology side of things to ensure that you are delivering 
you know, all the promise of that stadium. And this leads to the poll that actually I hopefully will be coming up at some time on, your, on the screens. Um, I'm keen to look at this sense of companies investing in, uh, well, I hope the poll is going to appear. There we go. So um, we know the opposition in North London, they've had some difficult the years opposition. since they built their stadium. So I'm wondering how you as an audience think team performance is generally affected in the five years after you move into a new stadium. Is it better or is it worse? Clearly, they've got to pay off. I think the last year's accounts showed net financial liabilities of 756 million. It's a big chunk of change. Um, so how does that affect the team performance? We'd love to see what you guys think about it. Seems as though there are a lot of Spurs fans in the audience. Or <laughs> OK, so that seems relatively positive. Clearly, your board thought so as well. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made this decision. Um, I, I'm, we've got not a huge amount of time left. I, I'm wondering then. For those, that leads into then my question, like for those um, technological solutions that you have, how much of the weight is on you to deliver that promise and how much of it is it shared with sort of the commercial teams as well? Like, is it, how closely do you guys work hand in glove to deliver it? We, we, uh, we have a shared responsibility. Obviously, we have accountability to our board of directors who we work very closely with. It, with. So myself and my peers, we work very closely with um, our chairman, Daniel Levy, and, and fellow board members to de deliver upon the vision that's been set for the football club. So it's not individuals making decisions. We're making this as a, as a small group uh, about what's right for our business. Of course, the stadium was a, was a significant project that we've been working on for the last... I'd say last 10, 15 years, right? Um, but now it's the next stage of what we do. How do we standardize? How do we optimize our venue? How do we make our football team perform better? Um, how do we squeeze our asset? Um, so a lot of those things that we have I mean, to do. You've got to stay ahead, haven't you? I mean, you yeah, every, every single stadium, every large, and think of a stadium as a large public venue. Every single stadium in, in the UK is looking at how they embrace technology. The standard's been set. I think we, you know, we signed another Premier League club last week. You know, for a retrofit on their stadium. And, can and, you name them? Or? I'm not sure I can, actually. I don't know. Down, I mean, down, I, down, I, on, down on the south coast. Can. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, um, but everyone's looking at that, but not just football stadiums. You're looking at how you use technology to not just change the experience for fans, but to increase the revenue potential of the football club. And then, then the challenge for Tottenham Hotspur yeah. and us as a technology partner is yeah, how much further can you go? We've got all this data. We're doing some stuff in real time, but what can you really do with that sort of degree of data to differentiate the club? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not just a football club. We're, we're in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are a multi-purpose venue in the entertainment business. Tottenham Hotspur Football Club plays at this stadium, but we're, gonna, we're doing other things too. So we need to run this venue in an efficient way. Part of my role also is obviously to support the football club and how we perform. I lived in San Francisco for a few years, and of course they have Levi Stadium there, where I believe HP also played HPE also played a role in, in kitting it out. There have been some teething issues with that stadium, but when it opened four years ago, four or five years ago, it was considered very much the cutting edge. You guys, of course, with good reason, claim that you are now. Having spent all that money, how easy is it going to be for you to continue at, you know, to remain at that sort of bleeding edge? Do you have the budget? I've got the right partners. <laughs> We, we, you know, so who uh, else are they using? <laughs> Sorry. No, we have, we have some, and Mark's right, we have some very good partners that we work with. Um, we've challenged each of these partners to keep us ahead. We've challenged them to give us the next, next generation technology. So if you look at wireless services, for example, we didn't choose a product which was out there in the market at the time. We chose what was coming next. Uh, we did the same with some other packages as well. So we, I believe we're already ahead. Going cashless, for example, is, was, a, was a bold step we are already ahead and everybody else is following. And that's okay, they should follow, right? Because it's the right thing for our consumer. But our job right now is just try and keep ahead and change the experience, not only for our fans, but obviously any other customer that, that wants to come to our venue. We do have a question from the audience, um, and we, I, I fear we probably should have tackled data a little bit more, but will sponsor, what sort of access do sponsors have to your data? That's, that's a really good question, actually, because obviously you do need to keep in uh, various privacy and uh, GDPR and all those sort of various rules. You know, there are various agreements around data sharing, but obviously from a consumer and fan perspective, they need to opt in to, to share that data. So I think GDPR has changed a lot of things, yeah. uh, I think for the good. Um, we have some key partners who are obviously very interested in the data. We can also anonymize that data to give them just a rough idea of what our segmentation of fans want. And I think that's probably a better approach uh, right now. They don't need to know specific fan information. I think they need to know what those segments are looking for and what they'd like to see and, and what they can do for their consumers. 
Um, we have more or less run out of time now. I had one perhaps cheeky question for you. What's going to happen with the naming rights? The club has obviously been in the market for naming rights, of course, and, and obviously there's discussions at board level. Uh, which have been going on for some time. I'm, I'm not really privy to that. You did, you, we're, we're not expecting any news. I course. can confirm it won't be the Hewlett Packard Enterprise Stadium, if that helps. It might be a mouthful. <laughs> but, but can we expect anything over the summer, do you think? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't know that information. That's, I think you need to ask somebody else that. Okay. Well, if you can get them up on your phone, we're going to stay here until... No, I'm joking. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much, everybody, for tuning in, and thank you to both of you for taking part. Thanks.